Hi guys, welcome back to MHI's roundtable discussion. And as usual, I have my brother Mike with me, our friend Rudy. And today we have the privilege and honor of having Dr. Rajit Ramasamy, who is the Director of Reproductive Urology from the University of Miami. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about men's health, testosterone, um, some controversial issues, and obviously areas of a lot of concern for a lot of our viewers. And I think you guys will enjoy it very much. So um, Rudy, if you want to do the honors and take us off. Definitely. First, Dr. Ramaswamy, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Today. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Again, you know, we've exchanged patients together. You know, I've been in the testosterone replacement world now for about 12 years, but it's always, again, I'm internal medicine trained and I got extra training to really be able to do this, but having the chief of reproductive urology and all the studies that you've authored, again, yeah. we are honored to have you here to answer absolutely. those questions. Absolutely, absolutely. So you. I think the, the main thing that, well, first, tell us about you and how did you get into men's health like this? Absolutely, so as I was um, training in urology, one of the uh, reasons uh, that I went into urology was to try to help people with uh, quality of life. And one of the fields within urology that I absolutely was fascinated was men's health, uh, was the field of sexual dysfunction, male fertility, um, and testosterone therapy and low testosterone uh, was affecting both couples that were trying to have kids and was affecting elderly men who had problems with libido and sexual dysfunction. So it was sort of a common theme to both uh, groups of patients. And I uh, trained at Cornell for residency and then I went to Baylor to do a two-year fellowship, especially in male reproduction. Uh, and then I joined the University of Miami. So, and ever since then, I haven't looked back. It's truly an enjoyable ride so far, and I look forward to helping uh, more and more patients and couples uh, with these issues. Amazing. Amazing. And you know, it's great that uh, your, your focus is quality of life, right? Because that's an area that, that a lot of, I think, practitioners have lost. You know, and, and focusing on, on a person's, you know, it's not just about the numbers, it's about how did this affects their everyday life. So it's, right. it's, it's yeah. amazing to see a practitioner that still holds that. Absolutely. Definitely. So I think one of the first points that I really wanted us to hammer today is we, we, everybody's seen the increased advertisement on social media, on TV about testosterone replacement low T clinics, even the, the, the testosterone boosters, yeah. you can't escape this. Absolutely. So there is something, there is a demand. So my first goal is, let's talk about what is low T, hypogonadism, and let's see, is there really a problem? And let's legitimize low T. So please tell us first, what is low T? What is hypogonadism? Absolutely. So before 2018, uh, the whole field of testosterone therapy field of low testosterone was often thought of an industry driven topic. Uh, but in 2018, something fascinating happened. Both the urologic society as well as the endocrine society basically said, we're now going to come out with actual proper guidelines mm -hmm. for male hypogonadism and testosterone deficiency. We're going to define this condition. We're going to see which patient should be diagnosed, which patient should be treated, what the follow up should be. And so since 2018, at least all practitioners have some sort of a reference manual to go back to and say, at least this is what the experts in the field recommend based on the studies that have been published so far. So both endocrine society as well as the urologic society defines testosterone deficiency as people with symptoms or signs of low testosterone. So what are they? They could be pretty nonspecific. Uh, things like lack of energy, low libido, uh, erectile dysfunction, mm. or signs of low testosterone like osteoporosis, uh, lack of gaining height, uh, can all be signs of low testosterone. And they should have a biochemical diagnosis of low testosterone. And the Urologic Society put a number on it and said a total testosterone drawn in the morning twice, uh, which is less than 300 nanogram per deciliter, is now going to be called as biochemical diagnosis of low testosterone. Mm. The Endocrine Society didn't want to put a number to it, they basically said, whatever the lower limit of the lab is, that's what we're going to define as low testosterone. And so basically, hypogonadism is now defined as someone that has a biochemical diagnosis of low testosterone, of having two low T levels in the morning, less than 300, or the lower limit of the normal, mm -hmm. along with symptoms and or signs of testosterone deficiency. So if you have these two, you can diagnose a guy with 
low testosterone, male hypogonadism, testosterone deficiency, however it is that we all like to code within our charts. Very good. So first, uh, I see that the, the preferred term in the literature is testosterone deficiency. That's correct. So, so, so we're going to try to use that, that mostly. Um, second is, uh, I think what's important, as you were saying, in 2018 at least, uh, the AEA and the AUA put symptoms of, high, of testosterone deficiency as part of their diagnostic criteria. Correct. Whereas before, it was a number. Correct. If you didn't have a low number, they, they said your symptoms didn't, didn't matter. That's correct. So 2018, we've been doing this for 12 years. Yeah. We've been doing this differently, but at least you have those guidelines. That's correct. And if I can go really quick over symptoms, and to me, symptoms of testosterone deficiency or low T very considerably. They can be very non-specific. And there's a, a window, a spectrum. Right. So we see in our clinic a lot of patients who are the lower end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. They are fat, depressed, ED, no energy. But we also see the patient that are the upper end of the spectrum. Mm. This is usually the executive, the mm. ex-athlete, mm. who you know what, they, he used to be 80 or 90%. He's used to, to, uh, to be at his best. Mm -hmm. And then now he doesn't perform as well. He's starting to have brain fog. He's starting right. to, his work uh, function declines. So we're not just saying that the patient with low T is the 20% one. That's a whole spectrum. Right. And we need to respect patient. I think this is where the art of medicine is coming yeah. back, where we need to really elicit the right symptoms, the right symptomatology to really be like, okay, you're not feeling well. Right. I understand you, I believe you. Whereas before it used to be, you're not feeling well, your level is not less than 300, nothing is wrong with you, it's in your head. Right. Mm -hmm. and, re and realizing also, you know, as I, as I listen, um, that this is an area of men's health that it's very difficult for the patient to actually speak about, right? right? Like when you have a guy that was in his prime and all of a sudden he just feels like he lost his mojo, right? Like mm -hmm. how do you explain that, right? And then to get into the whole erectile dysfunction uh, conversation, it's a tough conversation to have, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, to, to open, I think it's an amazing thing that happened in 2018 that it can open up to symptomatology and can, we can have a very broad spectrum for what that is, for right. sure. And one question, because you said the signs and symptoms, I didn't hear depression in it. So a lot of men it with is. low T, they, yeah. they become depressed because yeah. they're not responding as well. So yeah. would that be included Absolutely. within the guidelines? Absolutely. In okay. fact, I think there are several studies that have shown that depressive symptoms have improved in men that have been treated just with testosterone therapy. Yeah, right. Without antidepressants. And yeah. one question on the references that you were making. One right. question that we've always had as well, maybe you know, maybe you don't. Mm. Like if you look at Quest, LabCorp, mm. or any of these other companies, right? They have a different reference range. Right. So which one is it? Like which one do you base it off, right? And how are they basing these reference ranges? Right. So the so first I'll answer the question what I do in practice. Okay. So thankfully because I am a urologist and I have reference to the AUA guideline, the American Urological Association guideline, I could just use the number 300. Right. Regardless of where they go to, to Quest or LabCorp or wherever they get the test, at least we have a number now to use. And so I just use the 300, I rely on 300. It's just easy for patients and me to trust and, and communicate. Uh, the reference ranges really come from studies that were done, usually 2000, 2008, 2012, there was one study where as a population as a whole, uh, people went and drew blood levels and they took testosterone levels and they basically cut it off at 5% at the lower limit of normal and said, this is the lower limit of normal and this is the upper limit of normal. Just like they do for any study. Like arbitrary. And so that's basically where those 264, you know, the numbers. In fact, LabCorp, I think a few years ago had 348 yeah. as mm -hmm. that lower limit of normal. Now they became 270, 264. <laughs> Um, and upper and, limit 916. Yeah, so so you know these reference numbers keep changing because it's a, every time you sample a random population, if that five percent number is 264, that's 264. Right, if it's right. 349, it's 349, and whatever that lower limit of the normal is, that's how they're going to define their reference ranges. Right. And so it's hard for us as practitioners to basically say, hey, make this as the lower limit of normal and so on. And patients get very confused because they get a 276 number, they think everything is normal and they yeah. don't need to discuss their problem at all. Uh, but if you get an 18 year old with a 276 number and he thinks it comes back as normal, then now we're caught in a difficult situation because we know that that 276 for the 18 year old is not normal. Unfortunately, for testosterone there, for testosterone levels, there's no age reference ranges. Right. You know, and we all know that as men get older and they develop comorbidities, that they can have declines in testosterone levels. 
And so an 18-year-old with 276 is not the same as a 67-year-old yeah, with 276. Right. Okay. And so I, I think this is, this is, we're sort of at the juncture now that we don't know what to do with those patients and it's difficult to have this conversation. Oh. At the end of the day, I think it has to be some sort of a shared decision making where we as practitioners should describe the benefits of testosterone therapy if we think it's appropriate for the patient. Oh. And the patient from their side, if it's 16, hopefully the parents are involved in this discussion, discuss the risks and benefits and, and see what it is. Okay. And my biggest thing in practice is, why don't we try it? Why don't we try That's a therapeutic, therapeutic trial, trial of three months? Let's see where it goes. If your numbers have improved and your symptoms have improved, then I think we should discuss about continuing it long term. If the numbers have improved and the symptoms have not improved, I am the first one to stop testosterone yeah, therapy completely. because we think this is not from your low testosterone. Right. Yeah. We think there's so many other factors. You're leading a sedentary lifestyle. You're gaining too much weight too much fast food, too much McDonald's, too much ice cream. And that's why your testosterone level is so low. It has nothing to do with, you know, me giving you testosterone therapy because you feel the exact same way. Right. So, so, you know, to, to go over this, it's funny. Uh, I've developed a passion for endocrinology now. I never wanted to study it because it's mm. too out there. Yeah. But endocrinology used to be a, a, a based on symptoms. So you have to right. be a really good clinician. And the bad thing, those symptoms can be very nonspecific. Mm. And there's a lot of crossover between hypothyroidism, hypogonadism, hyper, hypoparathyroidism, hypocortisolism, right. a lot of cross symptoms. So the way endocrinology used to be before they had all the blood tests, if you make a patient comes to you, has those symptoms, you generate a differential diagnosis. Mm. And then if you think, oh, it could be thyroid, you give him thyroid and you do a therapeutic trial. You mm. follow up, three months later, are you better? You better, it was thyroid. If it's not better, it's something else. Right. So we went from a patient-centered, that um, symptom-centered diagnosis to now a numbers diagnosis. Mm. Right. So endocrinologists will tell you, now they are using 264 as their lowest number. So a patient will come to them with all the symptoms of low T, including insulin resistance, dysthymia, depression, ED, and I had that patient the other day, his number was 278. Mm. And he, they told him he was fine. And they wanted to put him on an SSRI, a depression right. medication. Mm. We got this patient and you know what we do different in our company, we're big on the basics. Mm. Before we even put a patient on testosterone, we'll help them with their nutrition. Right. We'll help them with their exercise. We'll help them with their behavior and their mindset. Right. And then we add the hormones. So Absolutely. When you I mean, do this, anytime I give testosterone therapy, I tell patients, I'm like, I'm going to give you this testosterone therapy. If you're going to go home and eat a bag of chips and watch TV all day, <laughs> nothing's going to happen. Because it's just going to be like a drop in the ocean. And you're going to come back the same exact way to me in three months and we're just going to stop it. Right. And so you're absolutely right. Even before starting testosterone therapy or even after starting testosterone therapy, I think if patients are not able to lose weight, exercise, sleep better, and change their habits, right. none of this stuff is actually going to improve. But this is where, to me, this is where the, it's the chicken or the egg. What started first? So that same patient, I remember, the primary care who sent him to me, uh, he was a, a pre-diabetic, gained weight, low T, you know, they put him on, 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 on metformin, they told him lose, lose weight, eat better, and exercise. But he came to me, he's like, he's like, Doc, I know they told me all this. I have no energy to exercise. Mm -hmm. I'm depressed, so when I get home, all I want to do is sit down and watch TV, and I can't get myself to do what I know I should do. Right. Once we replace his testosterone, his energy changed, his mood changed, his motivation changed. Recovery. Now he was able to exercise, he changed his eating habits. So it's not just the testosterone. Yep. The testosterone gave him the energy to do what he was supposed to do. And then now you have a much better patient mm. later. So, so to me, this is, again, keeping the differential diagnosis and then doing therapeutic trials, mm. especially, and we'll go about that after, that we know testosterone is not the evil medication that mm -hmm. we thought it was. When I went right. to med school, testosterone was a no-no. Mm. Absolutely. I went to med school back in 1990 at the University mm. of Miami. Mm. That's when we still thought that testosterone caused prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go over this. Yeah.